read a lot of web pages, and it seems nobody knows where Planet X is. I found this site at doomguide.com slash book slash dsg underscore 16 underscore 14 dot php. I will include the link in the video description so you can go there. It has some valuable information, which I think everybody should have because there are a lot of people out there who say that Planet X is behind the sun. And this is utter nonsense. Anyone who knows anything about our solar system understands that all the planets are in a ring or a, it's called an ecliptic plane. Pluto does not fit in, but Pluto is no longer a planet. You may recall that I told you why he was kicked out. He was puny, he wouldn't go to the gym, and then they caught him drinking light beer. And they threw his ass out. So forget about Pluto. I have read that the gravitational attraction of Planet X will hurl Pluto out into the Kuiper Belt and perhaps even as far as the Oort Cloud. So don't worry about Pluto. All the rest of the planets are in this ecliptic plane. Here's a drawing. The sun is yellow. The Earth is that green, blue, and brown ball. The path of Planet X is marked in blue. We have been told that Planet X will come in below the ecliptic plane, will pass the Sun, and then leave after passing through the ecliptic plane. Closer to Earth on this pass than any other pass recently. The path is parabolic. What does that mean? If you have a ball, a softball, a baseball, or a basketball, and you're going to throw it to your friend, the path is parabolic because the ball is being acted upon by the Earth. A parabola is the path of a moving ball in a gravitational field. What does that mean? If you throw the ball up into the air, the minute it leaves your hand, it is traveling at the fastest velocity. And every second that goes by, that ball loses 9.8 meters per second of its speed. So if you hurled it into the air at four times that speed, in exactly four seconds, the ball would stop rising and begin to fall because gravity is still acting on it. Planet X is the same way. The Earth is replaced by the Sun. And now, Planet X is just a ball with a whole lot of debris, which comes in and speeds up all the time it's coming in. It whips around the Sun, and then it goes back out to where it came from, likely the Kuiper Belt, but possibly the Oort Cloud. It's a 3,600-year cycle, and since I'm reading a page that was provided by Zeta Talk, they have a number, 3,657. That number is very strange because there are 365 days in a year and 7 days in a week. That number is 3,657. They said that's the average time it takes to go out and come back in. One complete cycle, 3,657 years, and it does vary. Why does it vary? Because it encounters things on the way, like Earth. And Earth will pull on it, and it will pull on Earth, and this slows it down. But it has enough velocity when it goes back out to go out for 1,800 years. Imagine you threw a ball so hard that it took 1,800 years for it to reach the point at which it stops and begins to fall back. That's Planet X. And it's because the Sun has an enormous mass and Planet X has a mass. And the power of the Sun's influence on it works on it all the way out. It stops it from going out and it brings it back in because Planet X has lost its velocity. And so it comes back in, streaming faster and faster with every second that passes. 
until one day it's here, it whips around the sun, passes through the ecliptic plane of the planets, and goes back out. Now look at this diagram. If planet X is coming in, at which point is it behind the sun? My answer, it is never behind the sun, never, never. In order to be behind the sun, it would have to be on the same plane as the earth and the sun. And you can see by this picture that only takes place once. And when it's there at the ecliptic plane located between the sun and the earth, there's going to be a shadow on the earth. We're going to have a passing of planet X. Some people might ask, is this the three days of darkness? No. No, the three days of darkness is also the three days of continuous light because planet X locks onto the Atlantic Rift. It's the part of the Earth that is very metallic. And when it locks onto it, there are only two things that can happen. The Earth stops rotating or planet X just rips out that large piece of iron and takes it with it. On planet Mars, you have a 4,000 mile gash. And everybody has their theory about what it is. The scientists are saying water washed this out, and I say baloney. Planet X came close to Mars. There was a lot of iron in that particular part of Mars, and Planet X now owns it. That's what happened. That's my opinion. You form your own opinion. 65 years ago, actually it was longer, in 1947, I think it was June, a vehicle crashed. All the aliens died except one. She had a high fidelity body. What does that mean? She could rock your socks off all night. She was Whoa. a fast machine. She kept her motor clean. She was the best damn woman that I ever seen. She had sightless eyes telling me no lies. Knocking me out with those American thighs. Taking more than her share. Had me fighting for air. She told me to come, but I was already there. The walls were shaken. The earth was quaking. She had a high fidelity body. Now in 1947, we had no clue what formed the asteroid belt. We thought it was asteroids. That's why it's called the asteroid belt. But this alien told us that it was a planet and there was a collision. And I surmised that the collision would have to be something from the debris that's trailing along with planet X. It would have to be a moon or some of the debris that hit this planet and shattered it. And if it was a watery planet, then you have frozen ice in those asteroids. She did not use the term Planet X. This alien who crashed in 1947. She didn't speak English. She spoke 340 some languages, but she did not speak English. She only told us that there was a collision and it formed the asteroid belt, and I surmised that since planetary collisions are extremely rare, it would have to have been done by something that passed through, like Planet X. And so I felt when I read that, that she was talking about Planet X. I didn't make that clear enough when I did the video, and so some people asked me, where exactly did she say that Planet X caused the asteroid belt? It was, I think, in Chapter 6 when she talks about the collision that f shattered a planet and formed the asteroid belt. Planet X comes in with a whole lot of debris. The insider who saw it said it has a tail a trillion miles long and there are trillions and trillions of particles, some of them the size of a mountain. And we are going to pass through this tail of Planet X at least five times, according to Alex Collier, who recently said that. If this thing takes 3,600 years to go out and come back, it could have a tail that lasts five years, and he could be right. 
I don't like to get behind what other people say. I tell you what they said. I don't tell you if I believe it or not. I just say, this is what he said. Here's why it makes sense. But I don't want to go so far as to say I'm sure that it's right. Take one more look at this image because I want you to notice something. If you were to draw a straight line between the Earth and the Sun, and then you were to draw a second line at any point along planet X, and you can draw thousands of them if you want, tell me the angle that is created by the line that goes to the Sun and the line that goes to planet X at any point on its path. The farther planet X is from the Sun, the smaller the angle. And when it's rising up to approach the ecliptic plane, you're going to get the widest angle. What is the widest angle you can see on this graph? Is it 30 degrees or is it more like 45 degrees? It is certainly not 90 degrees, is it? It is never going to be 90 degrees and it is never going to be blocked by the sun except the point at which it passes between the earth and the sun passing through the ecliptic plane, and it's moving very fast at that point. It's moving faster than it ever travels. When it is closest to the Earth, it's going to grab the Atlantic Rift and hold it for a while. Earth will stop rotating because Planet X has a grip on that Atlantic Rift. And that's when the trouble begins, because if you think earthquakes and volcanoes and tsunamis are terrifying, wait till you go through a pole shift. The animations I have seen are that it jerks the Earth with a force we have never felt before. And all that water on the planet is pulled to the planet's X side temporarily. And when the pole shift takes place, you have a mountain of water thousands of feet high, and that's going to slosh all over the coastal areas of the world. And you're going to have 5.6 billion refugees trying to stay alive. Everyone has the same odds. That's government. That represents 93%. So if you fear Planet X, consider the threat of our own government. 93% chance of death with our government and only 90% chance of death with Planet X. Of the two, Planet X is a milder form of death. More people will survive Planet X than our own government's murder of 13 out of 14 of us. They built thousands of FEMA camps, a crematory, and 111,000 trains with foot shackles. What do you think they have planned? The Georgia Guidestones tell you. Now let's get back to Planet X. I want to read this article. Apparently there is a whole lot written, and this is 16.14 Planet X. It says, this section was compiled from the information provided by Nancy Leader of Zeta Talk. The Planet X prophecy describes a periodic disruption of our planet from an officially unknown object in our solar system. At the time of writing, the position of this officially unknown object was far beyond Pluto. And the author writes, far beyond Pluto resides a dead binary star similar in mass to our own. Planet X orbits between these two stars in a long, thin path. The reason I have to call them stars is because she calls them objects, and they are both suns. One is a dead sun, similar in mass to our own. And so the word objects is not really good diction. They are both suns. One is alive, the other is dead. Our sun represents 98% of the mass in our solar system. And of all the other planets, asteroids, Kuiper belt, you add them all up, they only represent 1.5% of the mass of our solar system, with Jupiter consuming just about all of that. I think it's absurd to pretend that we know what's in the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud. 
I think it is likely that massive objects exist way out there that are as big or bigger than Jupiter. Jupiter is just enormous. Look at this picture. Look at Jupiter and then look at the Earth. How many Earths could fit in Jupiter? Jupiter is enormous. And the Sun is much, much bigger than Jupiter. If you place them side by side, only one and a half percent of the mass is Jupiter. And the Sun has 98 percent of the mass. And later in this article, they're going to tell you that Planet X is only four times bigger than this, the Earth. The dead binary star is similar to our own Sun in mass. Planet X travels between the two. Therefore, the size of Planet X is much smaller than that dead binary star. So let me read that sentence again. Far beyond Pluto resides a dead binary star similar in mass to our own Sun. Planet X orbits between these two objects in a long, thin path. This orbit takes approximately 3,600 years to complete. And they're comparing it with the duration of the Mayan calendar. Now, the Mayans were a people in Mesoamerica, the Central America, North America area. They had an advanced civilization, and they understood and used zero. Only three civilizations have ever done that. I think they were visited by reptiles. I think the reptiles ate them as food because they sacrificed to the gods. And they practiced cannibalism. What did the aliens give them? The Mayans achieved some amazing feats, like zero and a calendar. And so we have to respect the Mayans, even if this technology was given to them, because it was far better than anything we had. And it just so happens that the duration of the Mayan calendar is based on a 3,600-year cycle. Why? What's the connection? Now the traveling companions. This peculiar planet also comes with many moons and other debris, which travel behind it like a string of pearls. This can give the appearance similar to that of a comet from one angle or a winged planet when viewed head on, due to the smaller moons that trail and snake behind it. Now we've all seen the Soho images and we have seen the ancient drawings of Planet X and it is a big glob of debris. Some people ask, why can't we see it? And the explanation in this article is that we can't see Planet X because it's surrounded by debris. And my question is, the debris does not reflect the sun's light? This thing is coming in from an angle. We should see crescents. We should see a whole cloud of crescents. Why can't we see that debris reflecting light? Now she starts the sentence with, as well as, I never start a sentence with as well as because it's awkward, but I'll try to read it. As well as moons, boulders, stones, and gases attracted during past visits through our solar system, there is a fine iron ore dust surrounding the beast. If it's an iron ball and it's magnetic, it will attract iron. And that's what happened to Mars. It got ripped off for a big chunk of iron. And if that's the debris that falls on the Earth, look out. If we hit that chunk of Mars, it's going to have catastrophic effects. And I think there are dozens of chunks that large. I think the tail is loaded with objects that are anywhere from fine iron dust to mountains and moons. On Zeta Talk, they also said that there are hydrocarbons. What are those? Basically, it's oil. And when we pass through the cloud, this oil rains down on the Earth. Some of it catches fire because of the friction, and it burns. And it could burn up the oxygen and suffocate people. 
it could rain down on the earth. If you ever saw an oil spill and you saw the, the ducks and the, the wildlife covered with this oil, it's very sad because you can't get it off. If you've ever had oil on your hands and you tried to wash it off with soap, it doesn't come off easily. You need strong soap. A man in Brazil saved a penguin and nursed it back to health, and that penguin comes back and visits him every year for four years. Just type in penguin and Brazil, maybe you'll pull up the video. I found it not as a video, but as a website. I'm not sure that it is a video. So in this debris we have moons, boulders, stones, gases, she didn't mention petrochemicals, but they are there. And according to the Zetas, that's how we have oil deposits on the Earth. It came from the tail of Planet X, which goes out there and picks up debris and brings it back to us. Now it gets confusing because whereas earlier she said that there is a dead binary star beyond Pluto and that Planet X travels between the two objects, listen to the next sentence. Planet X is a dying, smoldering sun. And although it does emit light, it is extremely dim compared to our sun and further diffused due to the massive dust clouds surrounding it. You may be aware that Jupiter is also a sun, and it emits light. And the aliens told us that it's a sun because it emits more light than it receives from the sun. And so they don't classify Jupiter as a planet. It's a sun. It's a star. And the alien group that said that was the Pleiadians. And in their system, when they took Billy Meyer out to the Pleiades, they got there in 10 minutes, by the way. Billy Meyer said, when are we leaving? And somebody, maybe Ascot or Pata or Samyasi said, we're already here. And he looked out the window and saw blue stars. There were five of them. And that was a very interesting chapter. The book is called UFO Contact from the Pleiades by Wendell Stevens. I think he was in the Air Force and his job was investigate UFO sightings. He lived at the Billy Meyer compound and was there in 1978 when two popes were murdered. Now the question you've all been waiting for. Recall the image that I showed you earlier while I read this. At the time of writing, Planet X is between the Earth and the Sun approaching us. Baloney. That is impossible because this was written years ago, maybe a decade ago. I'm guessing around 2004. And Planet X was certainly not between the Earth and the Sun. I agree that Planet X is approaching us because we haven't had a pole shift. When it passes through the plane, it will be visible in the sky and you will be shitting in your pants because we never had such an experience. The earth will be bombarded with the debris that falls to the earth and some of it will burn up in the atmosphere and so you're gonna see a light show like you've never seen. You're gonna feel the pull of Planet X and the debris. And if it rains, it will be oil that falls upon you. You'll be lucky if you don't get hit by a rock. A rock the size of a quarter will kill you because it could be moving 10 kilometers per second. And that's like a bullet hitting you. A big bullet, a 50 caliber bullet. And this is why Planet X could be fatal to 90% of the population of the Earth. So I think this line is incorrect. At the time of writing, Planet X is between the Earth and the Sun. It could not possibly remain there for 10 years, 12 years. If it's coming in, it's coming in from below the, the ecliptic plane. The Australians and the New Zealanders will see it and all those people on Antarctica who man the South Pole Telescope, SPT, which was built 
in my opinion, to look at Planet X coming in. The South Pole Telescope has equipment to see in the far infrared and the microwave wavelengths. We cannot see in the infrared or the microwave wavelengths. The electromagnetic spectrum is very broad. And if you were to stretch it out from Los Angeles to New York City, the visible part that we can see would be only the width of a dime. Two centimeters. Your first step from Los Angeles to New York City would be far, far broader than the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can see. You've got gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet and infrared light, radio frequencies. These are all part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And you cannot see almost all of it. Almost all of it is invisible to your eyes. So if you can't see something in space, it might be emitting waves that you can't perceive. A mosquito can see in the infrared. It needs to because it needs to feed on blood from other animals. And so it sees all animals as varying degrees of infrared light. And when it sees the right frequency, it knows that lunch awaits and it flies over and bites. And it could be a horse and it could be your arm or your neck or your legs. The mosquito sees in the infrared. The South Pole Telescope sees in the infrared. It also sees in the microwaves. So if you turn on your microwave to warm up a cup of coffee that got cold, the South Pole Telescope could see the waves inside the microwave. It was built, in my opinion, to view Planet X. If that's true, then Planet X exists. We have no confirmation from the U.S. government. You might want to ask them, why did you build it on the South Pole, Antarctica? You might want to ask, why did you build it so that it only sees far infrared and microwave? Why not near infrared or our visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum? If you ask a lot of questions, you are smart. And if you can't think of any questions, you have fluoride in your water. Learn to ask thousands of questions and write them down. And if it's an investment, don't invest until you answer all the questions. This is wisdom. The essence of intellect is the question. The more you ask, the smarter you are and the smarter you're going to be. Try to recover from the neurotoxins they're putting into our water. They have no right to lower our IQs. But as long as they're doing it, you must react by asking questions. Why is the South Pole Telescope looking into the far infrared and the microwave wavelengths? Why was it built on Antarctica? Here's a good question. What did you find? We paid for it. Do you mind sharing it with us? We should be the benefactors of this information. It should not be held from us by a dirty, rotten government that poisons children with fluoride, cadmium, arsenic, lead, and mercury. That's what comes from the phosphate fertilizer factories. Cadmium, arsenic, lead, mercury, and fluorosilicic acid, fluoride for short. When you get through asking questions about the South Pole Telescope, you might start asking questions about IRAS, Infrared Astronomical Sky Telescope, 1983. They found an object. They weren't sure if it was a galaxy or a planet. It was 50 times farther out than Pluto. And they weren't sure if it was part of our solar system. I read the article for the Washington Post. And to me, it looked like the greatest scientific minds in the world were babbling idiots. 
If something is 50 times as far as Pluto, at that time, Pluto was still a planet. They didn't catch him. Cloud, or do we count neither or both? There's another good question. Where does planet X go? Does it go to the Kuiper belt or does it go all the way out into the Oort cloud? Where is it when the distance from the sun is maximum and it stops going out and starts to fall back? What effect does the other dead star have? Does it pull it in? Is it moving fastest when it whips around that sun? So now we have a parabola with two attractive bodies. And they're both suns. One of them is alive and the other is dead. How does that work? Write down your questions and pursue them if you want to be an intellectual. So we have a 3,600 year journey, perhaps. 3,657 years pass on average. The writer says, after a long journey, its orbit, Planet X, moved through our inner solar system around the millennium. Does that mean the year 2000? She is placing it in our inner solar system. Would that mean Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars? She says, since then, it has swung around the sun and is heading toward Earth. All right, she's saying this is past tense. This already happened. And I say the Australians should see it. And when it passes through the ecliptic plane, those in the northern hemisphere should see it. I don't think people in the northern hemisphere can see any object that is below the ecliptic plane unless it's pretty far out. Far out enough so we can see it. And then it would disappear. The earth itself would block it. And the Australians would be able to see it very clearly as it's coming up to the ecliptic plane. Now you'll remember when Al Gore went all over the earth telling everyone that we need a tax because the earth is warming up. He forgot that all the planets were warming up and all the moons were warming up. And that suggests that something is acting on them all, causing tectonic plates to crush together and create heat. But Al Gore is not a scientist. He's a fool. And if you believe him, then you are an Al Gore University quack. And you don't know Jack Diddley squat. He made $100 million spreading propaganda and lies to convince us that the solution to our global warming is a tax. A world tax, the first world tax by these tyrants that own and control everything. Now they want to start with the world taxes. They've taxed everything. Now they want to move up and tax the world. They're going to tax the air that you breathe. Now let me read the next paragraph because it sort of fits in. The sign of Planet X's first approach were erratic weather. Fine red dust falling from the sky in places. Increased fireball sightings. An increase in earthquake activity. And I will add plate shifts, plate movements, and the heating of the core of the Earth. Al Gore told us that it's carbon dioxide in the air that heated up the earth. This is psychotic. This is delusional. The atmosphere didn't even rise one degree, whereas the core of the earth increased 4,000 degrees. And so did other planets experience a warming from within. It makes sense. Something strong and gravitational comes by, Everything inside of the planet or moon or the earth churns, heats up. It's activity. It's stirring everything up. Al Gore says, the carbon dioxide heated the air and the air heated the earth. This is totally nuts. I hope he enjoys the money they paid him for saying such outrageous lies. 
This is playing on the ignorance of the people, and the people are not intellectual. They don't ask questions, and you must ask questions if you want to be a leader. You must be a leader because we need leaders. We have a void of leaders. We have people like Al Gore. He is not a leader. He's a misleader. He's a cheater and a bottom feeder. I consider Al Gore a whore and a bore and much more. The next part is something about Boxing Day 2004 and Japan 2011. They're talking about earthquake activity. In 2011, there was an earthquake off the coast of Japan and a nuclear power plant was hit and it melted down. And radioactive material has been spewing out into the Pacific Ocean and then the currents in the oceans circulate that radioactivity around the globe, poisoning everything it comes in contact with. Fish are dying, people are dying, and it's all kept quiet. Because if it is known that there are 400 of these power plants, then it will become known that they have to shut them down. And that means shutting off electricity to billions of people around the planet. What happens when the electricity goes off? Can you get gasoline or diesel? from a pump that runs on electricity? The answer is no. Will trucks be able to deliver food to grocery stores without diesel and gasoline? The answer is no. Will the food from the shelves vanish in about two hours after the announcement is made that Planet X is real? And people start putting all the pieces of the puzzle together and realize they're going to have to shut down the power plants. 400 of them, because if they don't, we're going to have another Chernobyl, another Fukushima. And so money ends also at that point, because almost all of the money you deal in is electronic. The dollar is electronic. You get paid, it's a paycheck, they give you a piece of paper, or they just direct deposit into your account. When you make payments on things, it's all electronic. So if you have no electricity, you can't pay your bills. The electricity and water are already off, so you can't get a drink. You can't turn on the air conditioner if it's hot. If your heater depends on electricity to work, it's not going to work. Millions and millions of people are going to die because they don't have water, they don't have food, and they can't go anywhere in a vehicle that requires fuel. Electric cars are dead. You can't recharge the batteries. So they don't want to let the word out that there is poisoning going on every day. And the coast of California is seeing 10 times as many rads as it should see normally. They don't want you to know that. They will not allow Obama to make the announcement because as soon as he does, there will be panic. There will be 200 million refugees in America alone. There will be 5.6 billion refugees along the coast worldwide trying to get to safe ground, and there are no facilities to accommodate 5.6 billion refugees. They're going to die. And so FEMA camps were built and 111,000 trains to carry 15 million people per trip were built, and the evacuation will take place with foot shackles on those trains. To me, that means certain death. So those who want to reduce the Earth's population down to 500 million will use Planet X in order to escort people out of areas where there are no provisions for them, like toilets and water and sleeping facilities. And so they're going to transport these people to airtight buildings. For what purpose? To get rid of them, because they're going to die anyway. That's what I surmise, and if you are an intellectual, start asking questions. Are the FEMA camps real? What were they built for? Are the 111,000 trains with foot shackles real? Why were they built? 
Why are there 500,000 coffins capable of carrying three bodies? Why are they stacked up in the FEMA camps? Alex Jones went to the FEMA camp and videotaped them. And I'm pretty sure you can see that video on YouTube. And so you do have a chance to see what's coming if you can put the pieces of the puzzle together. Ask a lot of questions and start putting it together. So in Japan, in 2011, we had an earthquake. It poisoned the seas when the nuclear power plant melted down. There was 17 times as much material as there was at Chernobyl. And you know that thousands of people died from the radiation poisoning at Chernobyl. And so the precaution that our so-called leaders will have to take is to shut off the electricity by shutting down the power plants. And once they do that, you get no water, no electricity. If it's winter, you freeze to death. And if it's summer in Arizona, you will cook. We have to have air conditioning here. We have to have water, and without it, you die. If you can't flush your toilet, you die from the smell, the bacteria that grows. Anybody with a swimming pool thinks they got it made, their neighbors will be dipping into that pool and it'll be gone in three days. All the water will be gone in three days. People need drinking water, they'll drink your swimming pool water until it runs out. Each person uses 100 gallons a day for washing clothes, washing dishes, showering, flushing the toilet, and drinking water. And landscaping. I don't think that people will care much about landscaping if they're fighting for their lives. And so the use might drop to 50 gallons per day because half of the water we use is landscaping. That's why it makes no sense at all to put fluoride in the water. Why does your landscaping need good teeth? And where is it written, where are the studies that prove that fluoride is effective in preventing cavities? We know it's toxic, we know it's poison. So why put fluoride on your lawn? Why shower in fluoride? How does that help your teeth? Why flush fluoride down the toilet? They're spending three and a half million dollars and 99% of it is wasted if fluoride is effective. So why would anybody do something so stupid? That's all I'm gonna say about fluoride here. But 50% of the water we use is for landscaping and if you cut that down, you still need 50 gallons a day to wash clothes and wash dishes and to drink and to shower and flush the toilet. When Planet X was approaching, it appeared as a star. But on its journey past Earth and toward the Sun, there were some sightings of a second Sun. The second Sun was never Planet X. I don't care who says it, it's not true. What's happening is a massive body is bending the light rays and we're seeing bended light. And it appears as two suns. We know from Einstein that light bends. We know from the aliens that light bends. They don't use light years as a measure of distance because they said, first of all, light does not travel at the same speed all the time. It varies. And second of all, it does not travel in straight lines. It bends. So there was an eclipse of the sun and stars in the background seemed to jump as the light was bent around the sun during the eclipse. The sun was blocked by the moon, and the stars in the background were in a constant position, and then they suddenly jumped, and that meant that the light was being bent, and it is no longer bent. And when it straightens out, you see the light jump from one position to another. That's the double sun effect, we already know it. The double sun effect is evidence that there's a planet X. Am I sure there's a planet X? No, I'm not. Planet X will never appear to move toward the sun. It comes up from below the ecliptic plane. That's just about 90 degrees from the sun at that point. It passes through the ecliptic plane where it does achieve a 90 degree angle 
Its path is 90 degrees from the line from the sun to planet X. It's a T shape. And it goes up above the ecliptic plane. And it goes back out where it came from, perhaps the Kuiper Belt. I think it's reasonable that it goes out as far as the Kuiper Belt. But I don't know much about this other sun out there, this dead star that pulls it. If there is a dwarf star out there, uh, uh, one with a mass equivalent to our sun, it's not a dwarf star. Apparently, Planet X is a dwarf star. It emits light. It's a dwarf star. But the binary sun that's dark and dim and similar in mass to our own sun is out there somewhere. I don't know where, but it's out there. I'm not sure it's out there because I haven't seen it. I haven't seen proof of it. But the scientists are saying that it's out there, at least the Zeta Reticuli scientists. Each one of them has an IQ of 275 on average. They make Einstein look like he's been drinking fluoridated water. And the other toxic chemicals, cadmium, arsenic, lead, and mercury. And he's really dumbed down at an IQ of 180. They are nearly 100 points above that, and some of them probably have IQs of 400. Do they have mentally retarded with an IQ of only 200? That's smarter than Einstein. And they say that there is a star out there, a dead star. It's a binary star system we have. Our sun is one, and that star is the second. Planet X travels between the two and it has to go around each and come back. And the speed has to be greatest when it's whipping around the sun and when it's whipping around this other star out there. I doubt that anybody could live on planet X because it's surrounded by debris. There wouldn't be any light. It goes out into a very, very cold part of the solar system. The temperatures out in the Kuiper Belt have to be somewhere around 400 degrees below zero. How do you feel when you're in that kind of weather? If there's any heat on the planet at all, it would have to come from within. It would have to be plates been reviewed recently. I wonder what the Zetas say directly because when any message passes through another person, it changes a little bit. Have you ever played that game where all the kids pass a message by whispering it to each other? It starts out as one message, and by the time it gets to the last kid, the complete circle, the message has changed dramatically. Reminds me of the kid who was saying a prayer, and the prayer was, Give us this day our daily bread. And the kid said, Give us this day our jelly bread. Is that funny? <laughs> so the Zetas tell Nancy, give us this day our daily bread. And Nancy writes down, give us this day our jelly bread. It changed a little bit. I would like to know what is the mass of planet X. Planet X is approximately four times the size of Earth, 12 times the mass, and a huge magnet. Being a huge magnet is not good. Not good. It could pull the metal, the iron, out of the Atlantic Rift and take it with it. It's supposedly passing closer to Earth than ever before. The Zetas say it will not do that. It will merely grab onto the Atlantic Rift and hold it in position. The Earth will stop rotating for a while and then it will resume. But the side that faces the sun will have some days of light, and the other side, the dark side, is going to have some days of darkness. Then it will change its rotation, and the sun will rise in the west for a while. I think it's three days. And all of this is going to be pretty amazing if you survive the passing of planet X. And since it's a big magnet, this is not good. The insider who reported watching it on the Hubble Space Telescope says, you better have a lead helmet, you know, four inches thick or something like that, because it's going to make you insane because every cell in our body is a magnet. 
every element on the periodic table is a magnet. The reason that fluoride is so poisonous is because it is the most electronegative element on the periodic table, and people cannot grasp that concept that we are all magnetic, everything is magnetic. The sun is electrical, which is related to magnetism. Gravity, magnetism, light, it's all electromagnetic. We don't need something huge and magnetic passing close to the earth, this is terrible, as you will soon see if it's real. So as it travels through our inner solar system, it can have dramatic effects on the planet. It passes by, that's what the author wrote, and I'm adding, if it passes nearer to the Earth than ever, look out. We're all in trouble. We're going to proceed to the next section now, and it's very important. I want to ask you one question before we hear what the author wrote. Planet X is coming in, and at some point, it's no longer coming in, it's going back out. And I would like to know what you think that point is. We know that it comes in under the ecliptic plane, and we know that it goes out over the ecliptic plane of the planets. What is the midpoint of those two paths? It's the pole shift. When planet X reaches the ecliptic plane, it's no longer coming in. It's now going out. And the author writes, the prophecy in its simplest form, I forgot to read the heading, interaction between planets. The prophecy in its simplest form states, as planet X leaves our solar system and grabs the Earth's south pole with its north pole and drags us along with it. Remember, with magnets, opposites attract. And so the south pole of the Earth is going to get a yank from the north pole of planet X. It pulls the Earth in, but it moves a little bit, and Earth does not follow. It would be a catastrophe if the Earth became one of the objects, the traveling companions of planet X. I'm sure this has happened. If there were people on the planet, it killed all of them. In that case, it would be more deadly than our own government. When Planet X grabs the south pole of the Earth with its north pole and drags it along for a short distance and releases it, this results in a 180 degree shift for the core. Now, if you've wondered what causes a reversal of the poles, the North Pole becomes the South Pole. This is telling you this is how it happens. A large magnetic object comes by and causes the core to reverse as it passes. It just spins around and now it's facing the opposite direction. That is the core. The crust makes a 90 degree shift because it is dragged along with the core and it doesn't drag very well. There's a little bit of looseness. And so we only get a 90 degree shift. And that's why planet Earth has had a North Pole in many different places. And that's why we have the Great Lakes. Because when the North Pole was over Wisconsin, just north of Wisconsin, there was probably two miles of snow as there is currently in Antarctica. Antarctica was a tropical climate and so was Siberia. Both today are very cold. India is warm today, but the Zetas say that India will be one of the coldest places on the planet. Brazil is nice and warm right now. With a pole shift off the coast of Brazil, you will see one of the poles. When you look at the Earth as a globe, you see that India does not line up with Brazil as north and south. And so this shifting of the crust is not going to be perfect. It's not going to all move together. There are going to be some plates crushing, some land masses sinking, 
and some land masses rising up out of the sea. Who owns that land? You can be sure that the fascists will try to claim it, like they have grabbed so much of the western United States land. They own about 50% of the West. And I think those territories belong to the states, not the federal government. The federal government has emerged as a monster grabbing everything they can, grabbing all your money through their crooked banking system and grabbing land as if it was theirs. Who appointed them to be the land grabbers? Certainly not the people. So if we have land that rises up, I think it should be Liber land. In other words, libertarian land. It should belong to everyone with no one putting a finger up your ass. We don't like the finger up the ass. It's time to cut out that bullshit. If you want to put your finger up your own ass, go ahead, but leave us alone when we're trying to get on a fucking plane. So the core shifts 180 degrees and the North Pole becomes the South Pole and the South Pole becomes the North Pole. They have moved because the crust moves 90 degrees. And after that, we have normal rotation returning, but with a changed axis of rotation and a different geography. So we're going to see the western part of Australia go under the waves. We're going to see India go under the waves. And there are going to be a whole lot of refugees starving and desperately in need of water, and they're not going to get it. It will be catastrophic, and I hope that Planet X is not real, or put off for a few centuries to give us a break. But when we get a break, we push that off on someone else, and that's not right. Now she has given us a brief description of the exit of Planet X and the effects, interactions between planets. She is now switching back to the approach. Remember, the pole shift is the midway point. It's approaching up until the midpoint, which is Planet X reaching the ecliptic plane and the pole shift takes place. She told us what will happen, and now she's going to tell us, as it approaches Earth, complex interactions occur between the two planets. The first effect is a wobble in the rotation of the Earth. This is caused in part by a highly magnetized deposit of iron located between fault boundaries in the Atlantic Ocean, the Atlantic Rift. If we have a magnetized deposit of iron that's in motion, we should be able to generate electricity from it, and that would be free energy. I'm sure that some people figured that out, and came up with inventions, but the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office denies patents for free energy devices because it threatens big oil. And that means that our government, including the Patent Office, has been taken over. If the Patent Office has been taken over, what do you think about the Supreme Court, Congress, the puppet president? They've all been taken over. And so you don't get free energy. Free energy would make everyone rich. We have a magnetized deposit of iron located in the Atlantic Ocean, and it's called the Atlantic Rift. It's between fault boundaries. So it's where plates come together. If you had two magnets in space and one of them came close to the other, if the north poles were both on top, you would see the bigger magnet bullying the little magnet, and there would be a wobble, and that's what we're seeing. People have photographed the sunset, and then the sun comes back up again because of the wobble, and they film it going down for a second time in the same day. That's pretty interesting. We never had that before. The wobble increases until Planet X is eventually close enough to grip Earth by the Atlantic Rift and slow down rotation to a complete stop. So one of the things you're looking for before the pole shift is the wobble, and then the slowing down of the rotation of the Earth. Now once the Earth has stopped rotating, this condition lasts for almost 
six days, 5.9 days, leaving one side of the earth in darkness and the other in perpetual sunlight for 5.9 days. Rotation resumes when Planet X leaves and pulls us around. While it takes the whole day for Earth to slow to a stop, it only takes an hour to resume rotation. This is the hour of the shift. How are you going to know that the sun has stopped rotating? You look up in the sky and the sun isn't moving. It stays in the same place for a while. And that's when all hell breaks loose. Because when the Earth stops rotating, what happens to the water? It continues moving. And it sloshes on the shores all over the globe. What happens to the bulge in the middle of the Earth that's caused from the spinning? That flattens out. And what happens to the poles which were flattened out? They surge with water. So anybody living close to the poles is going to see sea levels rise dramatically. You know, several hundred feet maybe. I think I read that that bulge is 13 miles high. And you don't notice it because everything is 13 miles high and it does not appear to be 13 miles high, but imagine that that fell 13 miles and spread out evenly. It would be about six miles deep all over the polar regions. I don't know if that's correct. That's why I say several hundred feet just to be conservative. It doesn't pay to make Nordic people fearing that they're gonna drown in six miles of very cold water. But if I was living in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Northern Russia, Northern Canada, I would be reading this with great interest. And I'd be asking the question, what happens to this 13 mile thickness? The earth is 26 miles broader at the equator where all this water is. Because there are 13 miles of water on both sides. Now you might say, wow, that's deep. Not really. The diameter of the Earth is about 7,900 miles. The radius is almost 4,000 miles. What's 13 miles? It's nothing. So is the water deeper at the equator? The deepest place on Earth is the Mariana Trench. I think it's about 35,000 feet deep. It's located just southeast of the Philippines. And who went there? Two people went there. Cameron, the producer, movie maker, and the other guy was Richard Branson, Virgin Airlines, the billionaire. Why did they go to the Mariana Trench? Because they heard it was closing and they wanted to see for themselves. What do they know that we don't know? You can be sure that both of them are in the inner circles. And they are told things we are not told, and they are told not to tell us, and they are told why they shouldn't tell us. Because 5.6 billion people are going to flee the coast as soon as the announcement is made. The announcement might be made by Planet X itself rather than our so-called leaders. I call them bottom feeders. Low life, but they fancy themselves as privileged, a sort of royalty. They deserve things that we don't, and I hate them for it. So somebody is going to get six days almost of darkness, and the other side is going to get six days of suntan. Better get the suntan lotion out. I believe that Arizona will be stuck at about 10 o'clock in the morning for these 5.9 days. I lived in California. You might ask, why did I move to Arizona? It was Planet X. I was reading about it. I thought I better get out of here because a big wave comes in. It's not going to be good. I saw maps that California the only thing that was left was about 150 islands. The highest peaks, tsunamis will increase. Volcanoes will pop. 
I recall when she told us that if any volcano has been active in the past 10,000 years, it will become active again, and that turned out to be correct. And the last paragraph says, there will be major changes in geography as plates rattle. Well, we're already seeing that. Indonesia sank 80 feet. During the rotation stop, one of the signs that rotation is starting to slow is fine red dust falling from the sky as Planet X's tail drifts toward us. Then over a 24-hour period, Earth slows to a complete stop and stays locked for 5.9 days. During this time, Planet X looks huge in the sky. I think the panic will be set in by that time. The ancients recorded this as a fire dragon in the sky due to the appearance of the trail of moons and debris. Now, you know, in the Chinese culture, they have the dragon. And in the parades, they have this long tail. So maybe this is legacy from the last passing. But Planet X has not passed this close to the Earth ever, I think. That is scary alone. If it's closer this time than ever before and it killed 90% of the people last time, what are you going to do? <laughs> During this slowing and rotation stoppage, there is an increasing and almost continuous moan coming from the Earth as the plates are stressed but cannot relieve the pressure. Sensitive people will become ill from the energy that rock under pressure creates, increasingly so. When plates are crushing together, they're making heat, and that heat can radiate and if you're somewhat near the surface, you're probably going to cook. She has some nice images coming up. The next heading is during the shift. When the rotation finally starts after 5.9 days of being gripped by Planet X, it will do so as a jolt as Planet X moves past Earth into the inky blackness. It is best to be sitting or lying down when the time is getting close and have a lot of toilet paper around. You will be thrown toward the current north. You know, what really scares me are the 300 mile an hour winds because the worst hurricanes we have ever had are 165 miles per hour, and this is double that. The energy that the wind has doubles every 10 miles per hour. So if you go from 165 miles per hour, which is, you can't live through that. It picks up things and throws them at you like buildings and all those boards. I've heard about a, a two by four that was thrown into a tree and it went right through the tree. There's a lot of metal and glass. And if you get hit with a 300 mile per hour piece of glass, it could cut you in two. Look at this graph. The power of a 300 mile per hour wind. A class four hurricane, which is the strongest winds we've ever experienced in a hurricane. 165 miles per hour. If the speed goes up 10 miles per hour, the power of the wind doubles. And so let's look at that factor. We're gonna continuously raise the speed 10 miles per hour, and we're going to double the power. This is very frightening. At 175 miles per hour, you have twice the power of the wind. And at 185, you have four times the power of the worst hurricane ever. Now do you see everything blowing away? If a woman has her clothesline out, it'll blow all of her underwear at you. Imagine a big woman's underwear coming at you at 300 miles per hour. You don't have a chance. The power of those underwear would be 16,384 times as powerful as the most powerful hurricane we've ever experienced. That's frightening. You could be killed by a bra. Now is the scary part. At this point, a great wind will start as the Earth is dragged under her atmosphere. So that's what she means by you're going to be thrown north. If the crust moves, 
90 degrees and it takes an hour. We're talking 6,000 miles and that means you're traveling 6,000 miles per hour. And the atmosphere is dragged, it's only going about 300 miles per hour, but it cannot keep up perfectly. This wind will come from what is now south, but due to the change in axis, this is the new east. So the sun is going to be rising in the south, that's the new east, and setting in the north, that's the new west. The only problem is north has already shifted 45 degrees. And that means South has also. So I don't know what she means. If she wrote this in 2004, that was before that change took place. But we are already feeling the push from planet X as it approaches. As the Earth gets dragged, the oceans try to stay in place. Well, this is inertia being explained in terms of animation or personal will. As the Earth gets dragged, the oceans try to stay in place, inertia. This causes sloshing of the oceans on the coastlines. First, the currently southern coastlines, and then the northern as the water sloshes back. So, everybody living on the south side is going to get wet first, and that means that Houston, Texas is going to get a blast from the Gulf of Mexico. And when it comes in, it's going to go all the way to Dallas-Fort Worth because it's all flat. It's not going to rise up and go to El Paso because that's the highlands. But it's going to sweep right across Houston, knocking down everything in its path, go all the way to Dallas-Fort Worth, knock down everything there, and then drag it all out to sea. I heard Nancy explain that on one of the videos. She says there's nothing to stop it that will go all the way to Dallas, Fort Worth. She says be at least 160 kilometers, 100 miles from any coastline. I don't think that'll help you. They found whale bones, all ages, all busted up at the top of mountains. And that means that the water sloshed and threw them there and killed them. And so if you think you're safe being 100 miles from any coastline, think again. If you think you're safe because you're 600 feet above sea level, think again. The tops of mountains are not 600 feet above sea level. They found whale bones there of all ages, which means they died catastrophically. What could have caused it? I think sloshing seas would cause it, a pole shift would cause it. Let's put the image on the screen now and talk about what we have. We have some new land emerging. And you can see that it's off the coast of South Africa. It's also off the coast of Antarctica, which is going to be warmer. We have existing land that will remain untouched, and that is Africa, Europe, Russia, China, Indonesia, Japan, Greenland, North America, South America, Australia, and Antarctica. That's the dark gray, the light gray is ocean. The lands that will submerge are India and the western two-thirds of Australia. To all the people of Perth, might be a good idea to go to Brisbane, Sydney, and I think New Zealand is looking very good. I would not go to New Guinea because there are cannibals there and they ate Michael Rockefeller. He ran out of gas with his boat, he swam to shore through shark infested waters and either the sharks ate him or the cannibals ate him and one guy from the cannibal group came forward and said that a man did come to shore, they hit him in the back of the head with a hatchet, they cut his arms and legs off, put them on the fire, they drank his blood, they ate his brain and they devoured his body. He was like 23 years old, I think. So you see that little area there to the left of Australia in this picture? You see the light gray and the dark gray. The dark gray is submerged. New Guinea is not submerged. Half of that island is New Guinea and the other half is something else I forgot. 
Sumatra, maybe? I, I can't remember my geography. But that little cutaway part in the northern part, or the upper part, that's where those cannibals live. I did a video about that. I don't remember what it was called. Maybe you look up Rockefeller and you'll find it. So that's the new geography after the shift. They have a picture of the water levels showing the gray area to be flooded, the light gray already submerged, the white is the ocean, and the darkest gray is above sea. So we're gonna have a lot less land on this planet. Sea levels are going to rise with the melting of Antarctica, two miles of ice. If that's warm climate, how long will it take for it to melt? I don't know. A couple of years? It depends. If the sun is shining on it, it could melt pretty fast. What's reasonable, 10 feet a day? I don't know. 100 feet a day? I have no idea. It's a good question for an intellectual to ask. How long will it take for two miles of snow and ice to melt in Antarctica if it's warm there and the sun is shining on it? Another question, will Antarctica be the equator? Let's go back to that other picture. Yes, yes indeed, Antarctica will be the equator. What about Siberia? It will be very close to the equator, if not, part of it on the equator. So if there's any snow and ice in Siberia, it'll melt. Now let's go back to the map we were on. We see that the entire Green Bay area has flooded. We see that Central America is, for the most part, gone, submerged. We see all along the eastern coast, it's all underwater. The entire state of Florida and much of Georgia is underwater. And the Mississippi River is now 50 miles wide and it's salt water. What about Cuba? Cuba has some tall mountains and parts of it are going to be sticking out of the ground. I mean, out of the water. But a lot of Cuba will vanish under the waves. Will the sea levels rise gradually, or will they slosh around, kill everybody at the coast, and then rise gradually after everything settles down and the Earth returns to orbit? When Earth returns to orbit, we have a new equator. And if that part bulges, what does that mean? It means it's going to be 13 miles deep. And so a lot of land that is along that equator, let's go back to that picture again. Western Africa is on the equator. If that swells 13 miles, we get a bulge of all the answers. But that's okay. There's a lot of information here. Flooded and submerged areas. That's the map we just saw. The new arrangement will place the existing poles at the equator where they will melt before the new poles freeze. The above map shows the extent of the flooding due to this temporary rise in the ocean level. So we're gonna have a temporary rise in the ocean level from the melting of two miles of ice. I think that would raise the ocean something like 400 to 600 feet. I recall the Zeta said 675 feet. The next section, 16.14.2, timeline of the last weeks. When you can see planet X with the naked eye, undeniably in the sky, time is short. This is the indication that the final seven weeks have arrived and a timeline of events is provided. This is very useful. I'm glad the Zeta has provided this. At this point, emergency management teams are exhausted from the constant calls for help. By now, you should have a plan and be determined to implement it. Well, I'm in Arizona, and if the electricity and water is off, and there's no food and no way to get anywhere, life is over for me. All right, so she's counting 50 days. From day one to eight, we have a severe wobble. This lasts nine days. Why is it one to eight then? Okay, she's... She, okay, she starts with day one, and she goes seven days at a time. 
All right, so the severe wobble lasts nine days. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. She screwed up. That eight should be moved over one. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And she's got an eight there. The eight needs to be moved over, and the dark line needs to replace the light line. All right, whatever. Because it's only one day from eight days to nine days, and I see two, and I'm wondering why. So I count, and I find seven instead of eight markings. All right, let me see if she got the next one right. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Yeah, that one's okay. I'm not going to check every one. She got the first one wrong. Wait a minute. It says day 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, it's correct. My mistake. She didn't start with day 0. She starts with day 1. So we have severe wobble for 9 days. Then we have a static lean to the left. Where is left in space? Which way is up in space? What if you're spinning? Which way is up? So Earth is leaning for the next four and a half days. Now that wobble is from the magnetic push. And leaning is a magnetic push also. But apparently it stops wobbling. It's hard to understand. Then we have a 270 degree roll, two and a half days. Three days, I don't know what that means, by the way. Three days of darkness on one side of the earth and three days of light on the other. Imagine being panicked and it's dark and there's no electricity. That is chilling. Sunrise west, six days. So we're going to see the sun rise in the west for six days. That will be weird. That takes us to day 26. A dramatic slowdown occurs after day 43, and rotation stops for 5.9 days just before the pole shift, and the pole shift lasts one hour. And so the Earth's crust will shift 6,000 miles. You know, the Earth is 25,000 miles in circumference. And a 90 degree shift then is one quarter of that. It's about 6,250, I think. 6,250 miles traveled in one hour. The atmosphere doesn't come along without some slipping, and so you have 300 mile an hour winds. That's the final seven weeks. I never saw this image before, but I think it's pretty neat. You're going to need a flashlight to see it at the right moment if you're on the dark side. This is the last card and perhaps the most important. There was a diagram here without any labels on it. And so I put Earth, Planet X, and the Sun because it took me a while to figure out which was which. Notice that Planet X is approaching from below the ecliptic plane. As it approaches the ecliptic plane, it will be visible from the northern hemisphere. But at some point, it rotates. As it crosses the ecliptic plane, it reverses. And the second diagram shows how it reverses. It also shows what the Earth does in response. These images show Planet X and the Sun as viewed from the side. The center line represents the ecliptic. The ecliptic is the flat plane that the planets orbit along. As planet X approaches our Earth, it lies horizontally below the ecliptic. At this point, Earth is aligned to the north and south poles of the Sun. And I wonder why the Earth's north pole would match the Sun's North Pole, because magnets don't do that. And the Sun is on a cycle where it reverses its North and South Poles now and then, and the Earth doesn't do the same. So I have questions. Planet X has to be moving very fast at this point. This is the halfway point it was coming in up until it hits the ecliptic plane. 
And after that, it's going back out again. So the maximum speed is achieved right here. But the next sentence leaves me very confused. It says, this is the position for some time before the final weeks. It is when Planet X pushes through the ecliptic that the situation begins to change rapidly and a severe wobble develops in Earth's orbit. The sun and moon will often be in erratic positions during this time. Let's go to the lower description and image. At this point, Planet X starts to turn in a clockwise manner. So, whereas Planet X North Pole was facing the sun on approach, it does a reversal and its South Pole is then facing the sun. And Planet X aligns with the Sun's North and South Pole, as you can see in the diagram. At this point, Planet X starts to turn in a clockwise manner. As Planet X swings its North Pole to the right, Earth moves her North Pole away, falling on her side in a lean to the left. You have to look at the top picture. That's the way the Earth begins. And then it winds up in the bottom picture with the arrow pointing at it. The Earth is to the far left. Planet X is in the middle and the Sun is to the far right. The Sun is so much larger than Planet X or the Earth that these diagrams fool you. They all appear about the same size. Remember, 98% of all the mass in our solar system is in the Sun. And so Earth probably doesn't even show up as 0.0%. It's that small. The writer says, keep an eye on Polaris or the Southern Cross to determine this event. This will also bring the tail of Planet X is facing the sun. So that's confusing. The next confusing thing is what it says next. This slow 270 degree roll continues and Earth must avoid the North Pole of Planet X. All right, so as Planet X is rotating around, doing a reversal, the Earth has to do a reversal also. I don't know what a 270 degree roll is, but let's go along with it. So the Earth is trying to avoid the North Pole of Planet X, which is facing us, the Earth, and so our North Pole goes around to the backside with the South Pole, Antarctica, facing the Sun. The author says, The Earth's North Pole avoids the North Pole of Planet X by pushing her North Pole away, lying on her side. This produces three days of darkness. Well, the Northern Hemisphere is going to be dark for three days according to that. So I guess locking on to the Atlantic Rift already happened. And now we're in the pole shift. Three days of darkness, the Northern Hemisphere is in the darkness, and the Southern Hemisphere, Australia, has three days of light. This is news because I didn't really understand the orientation of the Earth relative to Planet X, nor did I play out in my mind that the North Pole of Planet X is going to do a reversal and come at us, pushing our North Pole to the farthest point and attracting the South Pole and pulling it into Venus's orbit. If the Earth is pulled into Venus's orbit, it's going to get very hot for a few months. Until Earth goes back into its orbit, what force is going to push Earth back into its orbit? The sudden shift of the North Pole pointing up to the North Pole pointing to the left relative to the Sun is going to cause a lot of sloshing of water and the coastal areas are going to get drenched. I'm talking about Big waves coming in, larger than you've ever seen before, knocking down steel and glass buildings, old brick buildings. It's going to destroy most coastal areas. There will be a lot of rebuilding afterward. So the Northern Hemisphere will have three days of darkness, and this is the first time I've ever become aware of that. 
Earth continues to roll in sync with Planet X, and everything is turned upside down. This creates a condition of sunrise west, which lasts for six days. I don't see how the northern hemisphere can have a sunrise at all. The orientation is the northern hemisphere is in darkness. When Planet X leaves the ecliptic plane, Earth will then realign with the Sun somehow, and I presume that the North Pole will be north, but that's just the core. The crust of the Earth shifts 90 degrees and it doesn't go back. Things are going to get very weird. The sun rising in the west is going to be startling to the people. But with waves sloshing into shore and 5.6 billion refugees trying to escape and all dying as they try to escape and the military putting guns in their faces telling them, go back where you came from. There are no facilities, no water, nowhere to go to the bathroom. There's no food anywhere. Chaos will follow. Cannibalism, perhaps and the military will be given orders, and they will either follow those orders or they will allow the people to go anywhere they want. Let's consider both. If they follow those orders, people who are trying to flee, trying to save their lives, are going to overwhelm the military. There are too many people. You let loose 5.6 billion people around the earth, the military will not be able to handle that many people. And so I see the military collapsing. I think they will be beaten to death if they don't. So they will be forced to use their guns and kill people, or they will be beaten to death if they attempt to hurt anybody. I don't know if people will leave their homes with guns. But handguns are a given. They're going to carry the handguns because they're going to be scared and they're going to want those handguns. Every checkpoint is going to search for guns, but they cannot put out enough checkpoints with this many people on the loose. Imagine 200 million people in the U.S. on the loose, on the run, trying to save their lives. There isn't a military force on the planet that could stop them. I think that people will turn on the city cops. If any military squadrons try to maintain law and order, they're going to be facing deluge crowds. And I think most of these crowds are going to be on foot because I don't think you'll be able to pull in and get gasoline anywhere. Cars will be abandoned everywhere. And they will remain abandoned until gasoline starts flowing again. And that could take years. It would take months for planet Earth to right itself and resume normal rotation. It says right here, the sun will rise in the west for six days. How long can you live without water? Can you make it six days? You can't carry enough water to last six days. Do the math, pencil it. You can't carry enough water for six days. People are going to be turned away everywhere they go. And they're going to come like a swarm of locusts. 200 million of them, minus those that perish from the big waves. All those people out there who say they want Planet X to hurry up and come, you don't know what you're in for. You don't want Planet X to pass through that ecliptic plane and head off where it came from because it will be catastrophic. And that's all I have to say. Thanks for staying to the end. Have a wonderful day.